This is Mark, and I'm coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. Uh, today is April 13th, 2023. Uh, when Thursday nights are our nights that we set aside for um, interviews. And tonight we have a young guy coming in. Let's see. <laughs> I'm not with it. I should know this name. This is Nick Ferguson. Nick Ferguson is going to be with us here momentarily. We had a little bit of a mix-up. He's Eastern, he's uh, Central Standard Time. And we're Eastern Standard Time, so he had to gin things up. Joe called him, and he should be coming in in a minute. Um, but tonight's show is brought to you by the Tribe Plus. The Anyone Can Farm Tribe. Plus, if you're not a member of the Tribe Plus, you might want to look into it. There's a lot of good information there, manufacturers, discounts, and just good all-around uh, know-how stuff, all right? So it's real easy to find. You just go to theanyonecanfarmexperience.com, theanyonecanfarmexperience.com, and go to Tribe Plus, all right? So this is a Tribe event. You know, we all come together as a tribe, um, and we kind of model that after, you know, Native Americans, the way that they do things, or the way, at least what we think the way they did things, and it was very uh, honorable, in my opinion, where uh, our, our way of doing things in this country is kind of dog-eat-dog, dog, and uh, I don't know if that's seem to it's not working out very well so the idea is let's get everybody trained up let's give everybody the opportunity to uh get out there and be the best they can in farming and that's that's really what it's all about if we can share information and share resources it just makes sense we all do better all right so nick should be coming in here in a minute let me read you a little bit of what he's all about um this is really good stuff. Uh, in, in some ways, I'm going to ask him, is some of this stuff been kept from us? Because you would think that we would have been uh, utilizing this before now, you would think. I heard some about something about it uh, from Craig Schaff last year when he came and we had a, uh, a day at the farm with with Craig. Craig's got a lot of good information. Um, and then we heard that uh, Nick knows quite a bit about this too, but almost to the next level. Uh, Craig is mostly a, um, a vegetable guy. And uh, of course here at Baker's Green Acres, we have a lot of livestock and we do a lot of vegetables too. But this system that Nick is going to talk about, it's called tree fodder tree fodder. So uh, the video that I made this morning, I showed a field where I grow fodder. I grow fodder beets. I grow fodder radishes. I grow field peas. I grow um, rye. And the whole idea is sometimes I grow corn out there. The idea is that I can turn the animals on that and then they harvest it themselves. Um, but this concept we're going to talk about with Nick is about harvesting from the trees, right? And I think that this is pretty wild stuff, and uh, it should uh, it should be quite interesting. Now, Nick is going to be with us. Let's see, on the seventh of July for an entire day. Um, is he coming? He's working on it. Okay. And uh, I think after this uh, presentation, you'll see why we asked him to come and speak. Uh, he's a permaculturalist, amongst other things. And uh, this concept of using the trees as feed supply for our animals is just really, it's a huge advantage, huge advantage. So we've asked him to come. Uh, the Friday before, he'll be here for the whole day, and, you know, it's it's a precursor to Tribe Day. Tribe Day is the 8th and 9th, 
And so we're having an extra day on the 7th. So we're going to open up the farm Thursday afternoon for people to come and get their campers and stuff set up and wander around and, uh, you know, spend the night Thursday night. And then Nick will be starting uh, bright and early on Friday. I'm sure it'll be great. Sure to be great. Now, where is he? Okay, let's see. The secretary just handed it to me. Alternative animal feed, July 7th. Uh, and the price on that is $97 till the end of April. It's going to be 9 a.m. to 4 slash 5 p.m. Okay. Um, the cafe should be open by then. So you'll be able to buy your lunch here or you can bring your lunch or, you know, run out to McDonald's if you want to, whatever, whatever works for you. But we, we, we're not going to be providing lunch. That's for sure. If you want to bring a picnic lunch, that's fine. What's happening? Okay, here he is. There he is. Okay, Nick, I started without you. Okay, I'm going to tune him in. All right. is. We got you. Yeah, Nick, I started without you. So I've kind of filled the audience in on a, a little bit of who you are. And uh, thanks a lot for coming. I was just telling them that you're going to be with us. Hold on. on. You got a good connection? You hear me all right? This is why I like to double check my audio first. <laughs> okay. Well, the format here for... Uh, I think I might... Are you there? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, I'm not hearing you. You're not hearing me. I've never Yo. used Restream before. Can you hear me now, Nick? Are you hearing me? Oh, not hearing hear you. Me. there you are. You got me now? I can hear you now. All right. Great. <clears throat> All right. Welcome. Thanks a lot for coming, Nick. Sorry for the mix up. Oh, that's all right. Thanks for having me. Good. Good. So uh, our format here is pretty simple. I turn it over to our guest right away so you can tell us all about yourself. I've already told these guys you're going to be with us on the 7th for a full day of fun in the sun here at Baker's Green Acres. So without further ado, take it away. Nick and I don't know each other. It's the first time I've laid eyes on him except for, uh, I think, some old pictures. You look like you're in high school there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Nick Ferguson. I, uh, I'm a an ecosystem engineer. I travel all over the U.S. and I help people troubleshoot their farms and homesteads. Um, and uh, and design sustainability into into their farms and homesteads. I've been doing this professionally full time for uh, I think around a decade now. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, I dove into the the whole permaculture thing early on, and have since kind of walked away from the whole. Uh, uh, P word. Um, I just, I find there's, there's a lot more political ideology wrapped up in there than practical solutions. I'm all about practicality. I want to okay. see real change. I want to see real, um, real success. Um, so yeah, I don't know what all to go into, but, uh, um, one oh, where, of the, where are you from? Tell us where you're from, where you're coming from. Oh, originally Dallas, Texas. I, I was born and raised there. Um, we moved to the family farm in Ohio when I was about 10 ish. Okay. Um, we had about, uh, almost 300 acres that we had in mixed forest and pasture. We had cattle, dairy goats and chickens and gardens and all kinds of stuff. My grandfather was, uh, actually worked, um, with people um 
in the Acres USA community. He spoke at Acres USA a lot, was good friends with Charles Walters. And um, I think he was friends with Joel Salatin's dad um, okay. before they moved to uh, um, South America. So yeah. back in the day. Wow. Um, yeah. So so I, I kind of grew up with the whole uh, sustainable agriculture, um, organic stuff from 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 way back in the day um and i just i thought this stuff was just normal everyday run in the mill um knowledge mm -hmm. growing up um and uh and yeah so i guess i've i've just been immersed in this for for a long time currently uh i live in louisiana right now okay we're, uh, we're looking at some property possibly in the panhandle of oklahoma and possibly in Tennessee. There's a couple of different chunks I'm looking at. Um, we'll see. Um, but yeah, uh, home base is Louisiana right now. And uh, we are um, a few years ago, we got rid of just about all the animals, probably about five years ago. I was just yeah. too busy with consulting, too busy with traveling to make anything um, sustainable and profitable. You know, um, it's not... It, Mark, it's just not very wise and and helpful when you're gone a thousand miles away from your homestead and your pregnant wife, who's seven, eight months pregnant, uh, has to try and get a calf back in the fence. Yeah. Yeah. That just uh, that just doesn't work too well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So recently uh, we've gotten um, some some goats again. Yeah. Um, chickens, geese, um, we're getting back into rabbits and, and the whole underpinning, um, to, to what we're doing. And, um, and one of the things that, that I've found to be the common, the common linchpin that, that really makes or breaks a, a farm, a homestead type of a situation is, is this dependency on the feed store. Okay. Um, and, uh, and if, if those trucks aren't running, if the feed store isn't getting what it needs, or if prices get too high, um, man, you're just over a barrel. Yeah. And if you're, yeah. if your whole, if your whole system has been designed, um, around the expectation that I'm going to get super sacks of, of corn and soybeans and whatever else that you're feeding. Um, you know, if your whole business model, if your whole farm enterprise is built on and predicated on that, and there's, there's no flexibility, there's no wiggle room. Um, man, you have, you have a brittle system. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that, that led me to, to start looking into old tech, old technology, okay. old ways of doing things. Um, and that led me to, uh, fodder trees. And so I've been, I've been preaching the good news of, of tree feed for seven, eight years now, and it's starting to get some traction. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's okay. Can, can you, can you, uh, just brief us real quick on, what is permaculture anyway? What is that? I mean, you want to uh, stay away from it, but we need to know what is that. Yeah, so so permaculture is um, is a design science that uh, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren um, developed, coined the term, um, and started teaching. Gosh, I, I don't even know when when that all started um, in the seventies or eighties, probably in the eighties. Okay. Um, and, and that's just a, uh, it's, it's a design science that attempts to, um, make, to work with nature instead of in conflict with nature, um, and work more harmoniously with the environment that you find yourself in, um, okay. to, I guess, use, a, a martial arts metaphor it's it's more of like aikido it's um and jujitsu it's using uh 
the, uh, you know, it's, it's flowing with your opponent rather than coming up hard against it. You know, the, the Western okay. agricultural model is if it's in the way, smash it, plow it, drill it, poison it. Um, and that, uh, that permaculture system is, you know, you have too many, you know, this is real, a real popular go-to. If you, if you have slugs or snails, you don't have a slug or snail problem. You have a duck deficiency. That's, that's one of those things. Okay. That's, that's not always the case, but, um, that, that's a favorite go-to. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a, a documentary several years ago called the biggest little farm. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I haven't. Um, it's really great. I, I really highly recommend it. The biggest okay. little farm. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole lot of, of, uh, permaculture principles that were put into the design and establishment and ongoing efforts with that farm. So, okay. um, so that, I think the the video that really, you know, made me excited back in the day was "Greening the Desert" by by uh, Jeff Lawton. Okay. So that's another really cool video that you could uh, look up on YouTube is "Greening the Desert" by Jeff Lawton. G E O F F. Okay. So I think I think I know where you're coming from. Um, you you came out of the permaculture thing but you just you took from it the stuff that works exactly and left a lot of the uh political you know stuff yep. you know because we did have them coming to us for a while and we let them use mm -hmm. our our facility to teach in and stuff and i noticed that there was sort of there was stuff there that i didn't come here for you know i yeah. was just interested in learning how to do this thing and mm -hmm. those ideals a lot of times weren't really productive i didn't think they were <clears> trying to form the person into a different psyche in some yeah. ways a little little strange so yeah the, we never went back to it yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of mysticism there's a lot of earth worship um yeah. in in a lot of the permaculture um groups and you know i'm not hating on them i mean yeah. a lot of them are, are doing excellent excellent work um, it's just, it's just not my flavor. Yeah. Um, it's not what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, uh, to, to give a, um, an example. Um, so I was talking to a permaculture guy about, um, the family land that, that we are stewarding and, uh, and we're talking about, you know, harvest, uh, you know, I'm harvesting pine trees. We have, big i mean we're talking 26 28 inch dbh pine trees that are over 100 foot tall okay and they're in decline and you know this is this is regrowth forest this is not old growth stuff this is you know been in pine and sweet gum and this is all pioneer species regrowth forest species and you know i'm talking about harvesting the the lumber um composting the you know, the bark and, and the, the limb tops making biochar, you know, we're going to, you know, really utilize everything we can get out of, out of, you know, this forest. Yeah. And, and the, the permaculture answer, um, <laughs> instead of making the land productive and, and profitable and, and feed the people that live on it, his, you know, his suggestion was, well, why don't you find some land somewhere else that doesn't have big established trees on it. And I just said, man, that is upside down and yeah. bass backwards. Yeah. You know, we need to, uh, we need to be able to utilize the land and make it productive and make it profitable and also make it sustainable. You know, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in saving bo baby polar bears for the sake of saving baby polar bears. You know, if if my efforts to make beautiful, wonderful, um, very healthy soil so that I can grow healthy plants and healthy animals results in sequestering tons and tons of carbon. 
great. Yeah. That, that's a great, happy side effect in, in my book. But that's not my goal, is to sequester I carbon. See. My goal is to build deep, rich soil Yeah. so that I can have healthy animals and so that I can catch the rainwater that falls on, on the property and have it stay there long enough for me yeah. to use it. Yeah. So you're not a preservationist. I, I think the, the firm... The permaculture people, they're preserving it just for the sake of preserving it. But right. who's going to take care of the human beings? It would be my question, you know. Right. And I think the human beings are pretty good, a pretty good species, and we need to feed them. Okay. Okay. I, I get that. And that's cool. It's good to get that out of the way. But you've gone to another level where you're seeing uh the brittleness, I think it was a word you used, of the system that we have because it's sort of like if we eat out of the store all the time, mm -hmm. that's a system that could could go down in a heartbeat. But if we're feeding our animals from the store, same, same, right? So pretty much you've come up with a fix. You've come yeah. up with a fix. So let's hear it. Yeah. yeah well, or you I mean, focused on this, but I mean, you do right. other things too, but you focused on this. Right, right. Well, you know, okay. just. Oh, you know, like I said, over over the last ten years of of consulting with with clients and helping people um, troubleshoot on their farms, I kept running up against you know this problem of you know everyone's you know they've got chickens right, and so yeah. when you feed the chickens, you well you go to the feed store and you get chicken laying pellets. Yeah. Um, you get you know sixteen percent lay pellets, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. and that's what you feed your chickens. Yeah. for your whole life and then yeah. okay well you're you're getting some some cattle well what do you do well you need pasture for the cattle right um but you also need to feed them some of that beef weight gain ration yeah and and it, without that you don't you know you can't raise the number of cattle that you need to raise on the land that you're working with right mm -hmm. um and and every single system all came down to the same kinds of things we need <laughs> outside inputs yeah um always. and 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 listen i i use outside inputs i'm not saying that the goal needs to be 100 self-sufficiency because that's yeah. i just don't think it's possible um but i don't want i don't want to live paycheck to paycheck and have to go to the grocery store every single day to be able to feed my family. And, and what I've seen is a lot of people that get into homesteading and get into small scale farming. Um, they are, they're taking this modern mindset of paycheck to paycheck, go yeah. to the grocery store every day where they're going to the feed store every week to pick up feed. And, you know, it's just there's there's no resiliency. Um, there's not enough self-sufficiency and self-reliance to get them through hard times. And what I always try to do is when I'm designing a property, I try to think about, OK, what is the worst case scenario? And I like to try, if at all possible, to design a system that if the stink hits the fan and everything goes sideways, yeah, that family can still feed their family. Bare minimum, they can still feed their family. They might have to pare down the number, their, their stocking density with the cattle or whatever, or yeah. the dairy goats or whatever they're, they're into. They might have to cut that down significantly, but they will be able to still function and still operate with no diesel no electricity and no feed store inputs. And I think that's really important. So, you know, if we design from, it'll still work worst case scenario, that is a good place to start. And then, you know, on top of that, man, I, I like mechanical inventions that make my life easier. You know, I, I'm a, a lot of the, and this gets back to the whole permaculture thing. A lot of the, the people in the permaculture movement, they despise plastics and the use of electricity and um, 
and diesel. I mean, oh, you know, petroleum is just is just terrible. And yeah. um, I mean, it's 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 a, a sin against Mother Nature to to use a diesel engine to do anything. Yeah. And man, I tell you what, give me a mini X and yeah. in a few days I can get a lot of work done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to ever design a system that basically puts people back to the dark ages, um, and, and forces you into getting out there with a scythe to, to cut some hay to feed your animals. Um, but if we can design it so that if, if times got really tough, you know, I don't know if there was a, another great depression. I mean, that's never happened before. People have never had hard times before, right? Right. Um, you know, history rhymes, if not repeats. And, and we know, and we know things can go wrong. And the only question really is, when will they and how bad will that be? Um, and I'm not a gloom and doomer. Um, but you know, I've got a responsibility to take care of my family Yeah, and, and I want to see my children grow up healthy and happy and well-fed and I want them to have good quality food. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you know, that with that responsibility comes, um, an interest in making sure that I have systems in place that, allow me to take care of my family mm -hmm. and uh and you know like like we said that dependence on that feed store is is one of those major sticking points that you know if everything i'm doing requires you know feed store inputs in you know pelletized feed to keep my rabbits fed well i designed a broken system so yeah um so I don't know if this is a good time to segue into. You yeah, know, it is. Let's go into the trees. What what have you yeah, discovered yeah. about foddering trees? Yeah. So so you know this is this is old old technology. This is what people have been doing for literally thousands of years, harvesting tree leaves to to feed their livestock. Um, people are still doing it. It is still a an old time culturally um, deep rooted, um, system in, in much of Europe, they will, they will cut tree hay and they'll cut leaves off of trees, cut branches off of trees and, and dry it. And, and they'll feed those dried leaves to their livestock throughout the winter. Okay. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's a whole bunch of species that work well. Um, but some species are better suited for some livestock than others. Horses are notorious for, um, not, not doing well on, on a whole bunch of different things. So some of these things can be quite toxic to some livestock. Um, my three favorites, the ones that I sell in my store, the ones that I encourage people to start with, um, are white mulberry. I think it's the king of protein. Okay. It grows from zone 10 to, I think zone three. Um, so pretty much it grows anywhere in the continental U S. Um, hybrid <laughs> willow. That's another big one. Um, and hybrid poplar. Uh, we planted last year, we planted middle of April. So it was kind of late for Louisiana. We planted 800 trees in about an afternoon for the purpose of growing fodder. Okay. Um, and we planted white mulberry, hybrid poplar and hybrid willow. And, um, the, all three of those, as far as I understand, and with all of the information I can gather, all three of those are perfectly suited um, and non-toxic for all um, domestic livestock. 
Okay. Including horses. And horses are kind of the litmus test. If it'll if it's poisonous to a horse, um that it might be poisonous to sheep or goats. Um but if it's safe for a horse, it's pretty much safe for everything else. Okay. Um, will they so, eat it if it's poisonous for them? They will. They will they if will. they're hungry. Huh. Um, or, you know, for instance, one of the the, the methods of, of preserving it, you know, we've talked about drying it, um, but you can also ferment it like you would with uh, with corn in, in the milk phase, corn okay. silage. Yeah. Um, so you can ensile the, the, the fodder leaves and ferment them and preserve them and increase the digestibility. And so when you have something like that, well, a lot of flavors get masked and uh, and they kind of meld and become more uniform. And so, you know, if you had horses that were hungry and you had a batch that had high amounts of something that's poisonous to them, they might not know and they might just gobble it down because they're hungry and and then you have a dead horse or two and you know if that's a thirty thousand dollar horse that's a big whoops yeah <laughs> um so that that's why i like to tell people start with something that that is is known to be safe um uh what's and what is there up in my neck of the woods i mean all all three of those will will grow up there for you we're we're in uh four yep Oh, so that those grow in, in oh I, I thought you set up the three. Um what about yep. maple? Well, and see that's that's one of them that uh that is used a lot traditionally. Yeah. Um maple does have some toxicity issues with, with some livestock. So yeah. so I like to steer people away from using a tremendous amount of maple. Um I feed it fresh and uh and dried to a lot of my my livestock. I've had cattle pigs, sheep, goats in the past, and I've never had an issue with it, but there are, there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that it, it might be poisonous in some species. Are you just feeding just a leaf or are you clipping off like a, a foot of the, the limb? So if they can, if they can chew it up, they'll eat it. A lot of those uh, smaller stems will um will contain a lot of sugars and protein in yeah. in the in the cambium and and they'll be happy to eat it cattle um pretty much all of those domestic animals will eat um any of those that they can they can chew up well yeah um so so when when we're talking about you know shredding the the leaf and fermenting it you know, if it's smaller than than a pencil diameter, then it gets shredded and added to the mix. Okay, so do you run it through a, a grinder of some sort? Uh, yeah, I I use a, a wood chipper. Okay. Uh, some people use leaf shredders. They make yeah. um they make basically string trimmer leaf shredders. Yeah. Um, you know, if you live in the city and and you have those nasty things that drop off of trees in the fall. I want to get them off of your land. You know, oh, those leaves. things that have, yeah, yeah. They make yeah. a whole lot of really good, beautiful soil. Yeah. Um, they want to get those off of there as quick as possible and send them to landfill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, those, uh, those string trimmers, essentially, um, you can take those, those, um, those pretty supple, um, succulent stems of the fodder trees and take that that stem, you know, you might have a an eight foot long whip, and you jab it down in that that string trimmer and pull it out again, and it'll strip off all the leaves and the little tiny stems, and and you'll pull it out and you'll have you know a stick of wood left over, and you can take that and dry it and use it for fuel wood. You can make charcoal to make yeah. um, to make biochar, increase the soil fertility in your garden. Um, or you can take that and, and shred it and turn it into wood mulch and put it back okay. on your, your tree system. So there was a guy here last year, Craig Schaff. Um, maybe you'll get to meet him when you're here. And he was talking about Romule. Have you heard that? Romule? Yeah, Romule. Have you uh -uh. heard that term? 
Well, he was saying that any uh, you, you trim the trees. Oh, uh, yes. And it, yeah, you trim them down like mm -hmm. from the tip and you come back in no more than one and a half inches and you clip that. So you just go over your tree and you're just trimming the tree with mm -hmm. clippers and letting it fall and then run that through the shredder and it's a, a pretty decent feed. And so mm -hmm. I tried that last year and we have pigs, we have Mangalitsa pigs, Mangalitsa, yep. Mangalitsa crosses. And I don't have a, I didn't have a shredder at the time. So I just cut it and then I took a machete and I just cut mm -hmm. it up like that and made a pile of it, had a bucket full of it. And I took it in and threw it to them. They devoured it. Yeah. And it took me a minute to make mm -hmm. that, you know, make mm -hmm. a bucket full of it. So I have this idea that I'm going to develop this. I'm going to get a, a shredder, you know, mm -hmm. a PTO shredder. Yep. And then make it my business to trim these trees because they come through and they trim them every now and then anyway. But if I trimmed them, I, I think it would be the same principle as coppicing or coppicing. Yep. You know, I think it would increase. I, I think the tree would grow more if you did that because that seems to be what they do in you know, apple trees and cherry mm -hmm. trees and everything else. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Coppice, coppicing and pollarding. Those are the, the two, uh, historical, uh, horse historically used terms for the management of, of those, those tree systems. Okay. Um, and, and, and coppicing is basically you, every winter you'll cut the, the tree down to a stump. And so you cut it all down to the ground. Uh, yeah. You can do this mechanically. You can just straddle the tree row and uh, pull a bush hog behind your tractor and just mow them down. And you can just yeah. leave it, all that material just rot um, and, and turn into soil underneath the trees. And then they will re-sprout and regrow where you can go through with a saw, chainsaw, um, loppers, machete, bill hook, you know, anything like that. And you can come through and you can trim it by by hand. Hmm. Um, but basically what, uh, what we're doing is we, we're coppicing. So we're trimming them down to the ground every winter and then they regrow and we'll let them get up about 18 inches, two foot. Um, but we'll let them get up about four to six foot tall and then we'll cut them down to about 18 inches, two foot off the ground. Yeah. And we take all of that top material and, and shred it or dry it or feed it fresh to our, our animals. Huh. And We're then you just that. let it. Yep. And you just let it regrow. Yeah. Basically, you, you treat these trees like a lawn. You know, you don't take your lawn yeah. and, and cut it down to, to dirt every every week because right. you kill it. But, you know, you let it get up six inches tall and you cut it down to four inches and you let yeah. it get up six inches tall and you cut it down to four inches again. And you leave enough leaf matter that it can make the sugars to make more leaves and more stems. Uh -huh. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, um, so that is typically done in a livestock excluded system. And then if you wanted to utilize trees in a livestock inclusive system, then you do what is called pollarding. And all that is, is the exact same thing, except you trim above the animal browse height. So, you know, if you have goats, you just look at how tall they can reach because they'll stand up on the sides and they'll yeah. reach up and they'll stretch up. And so, you know, they'll stand up and they'll get stuff six inches, uh, six foot off of the ground, maybe, <clears throat> maybe seven foot or so. Um, so if you trim those trees above that browse height, they can't reach them, but you can. So you can come by and you can uh, use pole trimmers. Um uh, you know, something as simple as, as a, as a battery powered, uh, hedge trimmer on a pole yeah. and, and just reach up there and whack branches off and, and your animals will follow behind because they know, Hey, we're going to get some good stuff when, uh, when the man's walking through there with that, that stick, um, we're going to get some, some, some yummy treats off of these yeah. trees. Huh. And so they'll just, they'll just follow you around. Now the, the pollarding uh, type situation, it's a lot more intensive with, um, with the, the workload. 
so to speak. Um, I I have seen people utilizing um, mechanical equipment to to pollard mechanically, um, and I've I've always wanted to see someone bring in a um, a, a vineyard grapevine trimmer. Basically, it's like sickle bar mowers that straddle the 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 grapevines, and they'll trim both sides and the top. Yeah. Well, you could use that same piece of equipment to to trim the the willow trees, and then just every winter you'd have to come back through and then trim up the sides a little bit tighter so that the the second year growth wasn't too close to those sickle bar mowers, or you you'd screw up the, yeah. the mowers. But, uh, but the regrowth is so succulent and so tender. I don't see any problem with using something like a, uh, a grapevine trimmer. So, yeah. so it's, it's definitely scalable. Uh, you know, I've seen, seen drone footage of, I think it's, it's Norway or Finland or, or somewhere, somewhere over there. They're, they're growing fields. I mean, thousands of acres of hybrid poplar and they're mowing over these trees with big combines yeah. and making bundles of sticks and they're burning it for electricity. Mm -hmm. Like I've that's cool. Yeah. I've seen that. I've, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it in person. I saw a video where mm -hmm. they had a machine. It had a sickle bar that was vertical and mm -hmm. one that was horizontal and it just went right down the row. Yep, yep, and it was leaving a huge windrow of cuttings, and yep. I thought, well, I wonder why they do that. But now mm -hmm. I can see how. Let's say you could, you could get that into some sort of chopper. Let's say you went through with a chopper, like a hay chopper, and chopped that all up. You don't even need to do that, Mark. Really? You could follow behind, and you could rake it up, and you could bale it, yeah. and you could plastic wrap it, just like, just like they do with wet hay. And they'll plastic wrap it, and they make haylage. Yeah. You could do yeah. the exact same thing, huh? And end up with with haylage wrapped, ready to go, huh? Mm -hmm. Now, if they if this has been done for many years, I'm sure that they have some numbers uh, on on the tonnage that you could get. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, so I've, I've found several white papers, um, giving, giving numbers and it, it ranges anywhere from like six to 30 plus tons of, um, uh, fresh leaf. So we've got six and a half to 33 and a half tons per hectare. So a hectare is like two and a half acres, um, and dry matter uh anywhere from 10 to 20 tons per hectare huh are are numbers that i'm seeing off of multiple different uh white papers that is substantial mhm mm that's certain that's certainly substantial right huh um and and then um let's see normal protein uh for white mulberry for instance king of of the protein uh, trees in, in my book, okay. White mulberry, um, and the reason for this is because for for thousands of years it's been developed in China and naturally selected for high protein, high digestibility for the silk industry. So you know, thousands of years ago they were selecting for good digestibility, high protein mulberry leaves to feed silkworms. So the work has been done for us on high digestibility, high protein leaf matter in the white mulberry. So just just the the wild white mulberry that you get has been so improved over generations and generations of intervention that okay. They're great. And, and we see, you know, on the low end, on the low end, 8% protein out of white mulberry with 
numbers as high as 34 percent wow yeah what? that's a big deal yeah that is that's a lot of protein and then um, and we're talking a deep rooted plant that can sustain drought that puts yes, deep sir. roots down yes so sir we don't really need irrigation probably mm -hmm. um it'll we can graze our animals in between them mm -hmm. so we're providing shade and i'm sure we could cut hay in between as well because mm -hmm. we're not mm -hmm. making all that much shade so i we, there's a question here nick and it says are you putting any kind of sugar when you ferment or molasses anything like that let's see also yes yeah. um you don't have to you don't have to but if you do add sugar you will boost the amount of lactic acid that's going to be produced from lactobacillus. Uh -huh. Lactobacillus will consume the sugars, produce lactic acid. It'll bump up the acid content, which preserves the, the silage better. It makes it safer. Um, it's, it's basically kind of an insurance policy to keep, keep it, um, bacterially and fungally safe for for your animals and and that's one of the things with with the silage um is you need to make sure that you're not overextending and um and making excessively large batches compared to what you actually need to feed because once you open it up and expose it to air then it's going to start molding and you can have problems with um aspergillus and and other toxins um from from microbes popping up basically it's it's molding and going bad so yeah. uh, um you know so if you're if you're starting out with this then i suggest something as small as five gallon buckets fill up a five gallon bucket pack it down tight um generally where this is done a lot currently in the world um it's done a lot in India and Pakistan, and and I see them using a about a kilogram of of sugar, molasses, whatever, uh, per fifty five gallon drum. So two and a quarter pounds of sugar or blackstrap molasses is great per fifty five gallon drum, and you just dissolve it with some hot water, mix it up in a bucket. You lay a layer of your shredded leaves in the barrel and then dip a ladle full of that dissolved sugar water, sprinkle it over the top, smash it all down, add some more shredded leaves, and you keep doing that until you've used up all of your sugar water and you filled it all the way up to the top. And then you cap it with the lid. You want to pack it in there as tight as you can to smash, smash as much uh, air out of there as you can you pack it in yep. there tight and you seal it up um and and uh put a, a a date on it so that you know when you when you uh when you sealed it up and it normally takes about two months depending on temperatures if it's colder it'll take longer but um in the summertime it'll take about two months to completely ferment and and then it's it's ready to feed or you can just leave it sit there um i've i've heard of people leaving the the silage in there for as long as two years so you know having it there for over a year is completely feasible hmm. which uh which i think is is fantastic yeah yeah if you had a a, a shredder or a, a chipper mm -hmm. and you went along and you trim trees and you had a big pile and then you blew it into a bag uh, mm -hmm. that's what they do here with haylage and silage yep. they blow it into a bag and then they mm -hmm. seal the bag up and they use that stuff all the time they also like pack a... it down they'll drive up on it yep. on the pile mm -hmm. and i think that would it would probably work it's starting to make sense why this would work oh yeah absolutely now why do you suppose the industry didn't go with tree fodder and they went with you know with corn and and haylage oh the old ways of doing things just isn't sexy huh because it's, you it's, think that if you're harvesting off of trees 
They've got deep roots, so they're bringing up nutrients from from way down deep in the soil. Mm -hmm. Where corn has really shallow roots and the fields aren't even fertile anymore. They have to put a little pellet out there, and I'm not even sure what's in that pellet anymore. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Well, um, well, you know, around around the year 1900, uh, early 1900s, um, a lot changed with with agriculture. Um, factory farming became a big thing, especially, um, you know, about 1940 and, and after there, um, we saw a tremendous shift towards, you know, chemical intervention and synthetic fertilizers. Yeah. You know, a lot of the, the whole war machine just switched over to producing, yeah. you know, petrochemical, uh, fertilizers and, uh, insecticides and herbicides. And, you know, there was just, there was a lot of marketing and, and propaganda that was pushed on it. Yeah. And I mean, it, it gets results, it gets results, but, yeah. but the, the long-term consequences are, are not necessarily a good solution long-term. It gets results, mm -hmm. but the, the the penalty for the, that faster growth is oftentimes, you know, a shorter, shorter lived system, you know? Yeah. Uh, sort of like right... taking steroids if you're a bodybuilder. Yep. Yep. You, you can, know? you can get really big, really fast, but you're going to die a whole lot sooner. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like that with everything, isn't it? It's a certain type of individual wants to middleman a process. And, mm -hmm. and I see it everywhere now. Once you see it, uh, you notice it all over the place. I used to wonder when I was a kid, I grew up Catholic and we had to s confess our sins, right? But you couldn't just confess your sins directly. No, no, no. You had to go to this guy in a little room. Mm -hmm. And and then I, I started seeing it everywhere. Like you made mention of, well, I'm going to be more self-sustainable. So I'm going to get some chickens, grow my eggs. But really, after you get done buying feed from Tractor Supply, your eggs are way more expensive than if you just bought them at at Walmart, you know? That's right. And uh, it doesn't, there, no one's really talking like you are about, you don't, you shouldn't be paying money for feed for your chickens. Don't buy them anything. You can give them stuff and they'll do just mm -hmm. fine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah, starting well, to see this just about everywhere. Yeah, it's and it's it's nuts. I used to buy um I used to buy laying pellets yeah. uh to to feed my my hens. I don't anymore. You know what yeah. I found? I found just having some good pasture, some some good forested area for them to scratch around in and some whole corn. Man, I bought I bought I don't know four bags of whole corn in January. I think it was in January. I still have a bag out there. Yeah. And and I have like two dozen chickens and and a handful of geese and a nine, I think nine or ten Muscovy ducks. Huh. And and they all get a little bit of corn. And we're having great uh great egg production. And that's all they're getting to eat is what they yeah. forage what they harvest out in the woods. Yeah. The livestock guardian dogs protect them and they get a little bit of, of corn and man, they're just, they're going. Yeah. All right. So um, let's talk about species. Can you get into some more specific um, <clears throat> species? Like let's, let's, how about uh, pine? Um, so, so yeah, some people will use pine. Um, my goats would, uh, would tear up some, some pine trees. Uh, holly is, is used a lot. Yeah. Um, but man, just the, the, the three just killer grow like crazy bulletproof trees that, that I like the best are are the the hybrid poplar which is a cottonwood yeah that that hybrid willow 
and and the white mulberry. You get those three, and and the here's here's the really cool thing about the the poplar and the willow. Um, if you're coppicing, let's say you stick 25 trees in the ground and you, you get them growing and, uh, and they grow all year. You keep them watered, you fertilize them, you kind of baby them their first year and they just, they shoot up. Um, my trees that I planted last year ended up I mean, at least eight foot, I had some that were 12, 14 feet tall in their first year in the ground. Yeah. Now, when these get a little bit established root systems, they're going to be pushing 12 to 16, maybe 18 feet in a year. That is phenomenal growth rate. That's amazing. Yeah. Huh. Where Here's the cool thing, Mark. Let's say you put in 25 trees. And you let them grow and you got, I don't know, eight foot. We'll go conservative, six foot of growth. And you cut that, the, those sticks off of that tree. And there's, I don't know, half a dozen sticks that are six foot tall on each tree. You cut those to the ground and you got those sticks that winter. You know what you can do with those? You can take those and you can cut them as small as two inches a piece. I have cuttings that I stuck. I just had a pot sitting there. I was processing some hardwood cuttings this winter, and I had some little cut-off pieces that were two <laughs> to four inches long. I just had a pot sitting right next to where I was working, listening to an audiobook, and I just jabbed them in, in a pot and just left them sit there. Those suckers are three foot tall now, and I did really? this in February. Wow. I cut those cuttings, and I stuck them in, in a pot, in February, and they're three foot tall right now. And these are mulberries? And these are the willow. So the willow, the willow so. and the poplar, you can take those hardwood cuttings every single winter, and you could cut four-inch sticks and go through the <laughs> field with a rubber mallet and, and a pair of pruning shears, and you could cut a little, little you know, beveled edge, yeah. and you could take that stick and just tap it in the ground and everywhere you put one of those sticks in, a new tree is going to grow. Really? So, so with the the mulberry, not not the mulberry, <laughs> with the the poplar and the willow, you can plant out hundreds and hundreds of acres with just a little bit of labor. Now, the mulberry doesn't root nearly as well. You need to have an intermittent mist system, and you've got to kind of baby them. You need to use some rooting hormone, um, and those are those cuttings are taken in June. July <clears throat> and and those need to go into like I said an intermittent mist system for for them to really root well um but that's that's a couple hundred bucks and you can turn out a couple thousand mulberry trees a year or you could just get the the seed and and grow seedlings huh. but but the nice thing is you know, they're so hardy and they're so easy to propagate the willow and the poplar that, yeah. I mean, you get you get one of those suckers growing and you can just exponentially increase the number of trees that you have. And yeah. and it's just it's just material that you would have just turned into mulch yeah. that winter anyways yeah. or burnt. So we have we have poplar here, like a mm -hmm. lot of it. And it's yep. almost uh it's almost kind of useless. It's not good firewood. It's not good fence posts. Um, but I've never tried feeding any of it. And we yep. have a lot of it. Yeah. So could I, can I try that? Do you th Absolutely. Do you yeah. Yep. Huh. And any of those huh. cottonwood species, aspen, um, uh, just regular cottonwood, uh, yep. populus deltoides. Um, that's, that's the most common poplar, poplar species you're going to find in most of the U S yeah. um, that makes a, that makes a, a fine, fine feed stock. It's not yeah. as palatable because it's higher <clears throat> tannin and, and it's a little bit lower digestibility than the white mulberry and the willow, but, but it's a fine feed stock. The pigs should eat it. Um, sheep and goats, cattle, horses should all eat it. Rabbits don't like it as much. Rabbits go nuts 
on the willow though and between willow and a little bit of white mulberry um you can feed rabbits pretty much exclusively that wow yep this so, guts I mean, my my wheels are turning here Nick. man i'm i'm telling you and and so okay so think about this from just like a small scale just a homestead size operation right you've got you've got a dozen breeder rabbits and you've got some some rabbit tractors so you can get the the bunnies after they're weaned out on pasture for about a month and and you cut mulberry and willow fresh and you feed those bunnies and you free, feed those breeders and you, you keep uh, a mineral block in there for the breeders and and you're you're just turning out rabbits left right and center because they breed like rabbits wow. well well man that's that's free dog food yeah for is. just a little bit of labor yeah. so i've got rabbits i've got trees growing a 24 7 365 days a year um security detail patrolling my property and you know i've got big anatolian pyrenees hybrid livestock guardian dogs yeah i got them too <laughs> i love them they're yeah. they're great um but man those suckers will eat you out of house and home if you're buying dog yeah. food yeah um so i mean i'll feed them two rabbits a week and i keep their hopper feeder topped off because i like the flexibility of being able to leave for a couple weeks in the fall and go camping or go hunting and not have to worry about my animals so we keep dog food you know the kibble stuff out there for them um and then you know when we have excess rabbits each of the dog i mean man it's, it's as simple as this cervical yeah. dislocation the rabbit's neck is broken it's dead and i toss it over the fence to the dogs they'll catch it the alpha will take the first one the beta will line up take the next one and they take their rabbit off to the corner they eat the the guts and they'll bury it and let it season for a day or two so it tastes yeah. real good they'll dig it right back up and they'll finish it off and and then they might eat a little bit of dog food man i had i had at one point i think six livestock guardian dogs and between a little bit of chicken leg quarters that you buy in like the 10 pound bags at at walmart um for the fat content yeah. um between chicken leg quarters and the rabbits those six big dogs i mean you know how big they are oh yeah i was going through maybe one not even a 50 pound sack of dog food a month huh with those six dogs hmm. and they had sleek coats they looked oh they looked yeah. fantastic yeah, um, i don't think dog food's a very good source of food for your no. dogs no 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 yeah. um so so yeah uh i i just crunched the numbers and i looked at the dog food compared to the chicken leg quarters um and the chicken leg quarters human grade feed yeah um that was actually cheaper than dog food. Huh. So, so I just, yep. I started, I bought a small chest freezer and I go to, to the store and I get 200 pounds of, of chicken leg quarters and I just fill up a freezer. Worst case scenario, we've got chicken for the grill. Um, yeah. Otherwise it's dog food. And, uh, huh. and that's what we, that's what we fed our, our livestock guardian dogs. That's what we still do. We only have two right now. Um, but yeah, so you get those rabbits breeding, turning out babies, their dog food. Chickens are are like dinosaurs. Man, you take a rabbit and you just open it up and you toss it in the chicken pen and they will mm -hmm. tear it up. They'll strip it to the bone. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. gets get some black soldier fly bins built. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. Yeah. Black soldier flies man yeah. they are amazing you feed rabbits to those and then you can take those black soldier flies that'll auto harvest into a bucket for you every day yeah toss them on a on a solar uh dehydrator rack and they'll just get cooked and dried and you can have high protein high fat bird feed for the winter time 
Yeah. I've seen that. That's amazing. Yep. So, so in this, this all starts from the fodder trees. So you yeah. get those fodder trees growing. They're the backbone that feeds your rabbits, your um, larger herbivores. The rabbits can either directly or indirectly through insects feed your chickens and, and ducks. And, and we can get, man, that, that'll take care of a bunch of your dietary needs right there. Um, and then, you know, we can, uh, we can replace, I think, uh, I have on rare plant store. I have a link to, um, some white papers. And I think in the white mulberry section, I have a white paper, uh, written about feeder hogs on white mulberry and they found i think i need to go back and read it um or at least take some good notes <laughs> uh, but i think they were they were doing about a 92 percent it was 92 or 98 let's just say 92 percent replacement of fresh mulberry leaves without any reduction in meat quality and growth rate huh with the pigs because you know all over this farm we have things that sprout up all the time yep. a lot of popples and you know it's yep. everywhere and i've a lot of times i've kind of wondered why can't we utilize that and so the other day i was at the hardware store here and i saw this really nice pto you know three-point mounted uh mm -hmm. shredder or mulcher. Yep. And I, I just looked at that and I said, for some reason it's speaking to me, but I could go down with a, a trailer behind me. Mm -hmm. I could go down in the back and I could cut everything that's, you know, maybe an inch and a half or smaller and shred mm -hmm. it into a trailer. Yep. And I would be bringing back a lot of material, a whole yep. lot of material. And, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of feeding stuff to my pigs and knowing, and my cows too, and knowing that they're going to run it through their system and deposit it with a lot of good uh, bacteria and protozoa and all those good microbiome into my soil. So I know mm -hmm. I'm going to get more growth. Now, what if I did this with the trees that are down in the back of my property, like the mm -hmm. like bulrushes and all of that stuff? I'll just have to find out and see how they do with it. Um, yeah. I'm sure if it's fermented, they they'd pre probably be okay with it. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a, like a tremendous amount that that they will eat and and thrive on. So, um, mm. I I say just experiment. Oh, yeah, with what I know you they have. will. Yep. yep. They they munch on it now as it is. And 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 the nice thing is is you know you don't even have to classify that material yourself. You don't have to sort it and and try and make sure you pick out all the big chunks of wood. If they don't want to eat it, they just won't eat it. They'll pick through it. Yeah. Yeah. And then and, they'll and just I turn the rest see, of it into good soil. Yeah. Yeah. I could see where you'd get a, a double whammy on that too, because if they're creating flesh and milk, that's good because we can utilize that. We can sell that and keep things mm -hmm. going. But um, I'm sure that the deep roots are bringing up nutrients that they're not getting from grass or even That's if right. we feed them grain, which we don't feed our cattle grain at all. Um, so then those, those uh, trace minerals would wind up on our fields and it mm -hmm. would increase our, our hay production. You know, it would, it just seems like a really, really good thing. <clears throat> I'm a big proponent of, turning a liability into an asset and yes. up until this moment right now i've never seen all those little sprouts those little saplings that come up in my hay field as any kind of of asset but if i could go down there with my tractor and some pruners and a couple of kids and we're yep. just throwing them through mm -hmm. man and they'd come back too i know That's they'd right. come back yeah oh wow and I guess then we would just have to figure out 
okay, how many different species do we have back there? What are they? Mm -hmm. uh, what works? What doesn't? So mm -hmm. this just opens up. Okay, I've got this big grove of birch trees, and they grow like weeds, you know, mm -hmm. and they're not really good firewood. They look nice and everything, but if I could get them when they're small and start coping, actually, if I knock those trees down and they're about this big, uh, they will sucker like you would not believe right mm -hmm. at that uh, right at that stump. So yep. I could have, wow, all of a sudden I'm looking at that area and that area could be a source of food. Once I get those trees small and they start yep. to coppice or sucker, mm -hmm. then it becomes a field of dreams, field of feed. Huh. Yep. Huh. All right. That's gone by really fast. We like to keep it at an hour. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to you come visiting with us, and I will have. I'm looking lots forward to it too. Yeah, yeah, you'll have fun with this group. It's a good group of people. I, the nice thing about the tribe is, all of a sudden, somebody comes into the tribe that knows something that none of us did, and then you run it through the, you know, the mill of all these people, White Dog and Helios and. All those real smart people get to think about it for a while, and then they start saying, hey, <laughs> uh, recently, we've had a lot of people have come into the tribe. I mean, like in the last two weeks, we've had over a 1,000 people come in, and I keep saying this. They're not your average person that wants to get into homesteading. These are people who were smart at other things mm -hmm. and said, well, the cubicle life isn't for me. I want to do something a little different. So we're getting a lot. I mean, it's just like a tsunami of people coming into the the homesteading world right now. And yeah, uh, I've I'm seeing. A lot I've of never talent. seen. Yeah, I've never seen my business um, as as busy as it has been the past year and a half, two years. I I have a waiting list. Yeah. You know. Okay. Hey, so <laughs> how can these? How can our guests find you? Yeah, so um, every January, I have trees go up for sale. Normally, it's about January 1st. Um, occasionally, normally, I'll have a couple days early where I'll, I'll post to, to my groups um, and kind of let, let my super fans know, hey, such and such is, is available a couple days ahead of time. But generally, it's about January 1st. Uh, trees go up on sale there at rareplantstore.com. Um, my website that I don't ever do anything with, I really need to get updated, um, is Homegrown Liberty. I did okay. a podcast for a year, um, years ago, that that's still available there with blog posts. Um, and uh, so Homegrown Liberty, and uh, I have consulting info there. And so, you know, if, if any of your, your listeners, uh, want to get on that consulting tour that I'll be doing on my way up to teach at your place. Okay. Um, you know, I'll be heading up from Louisiana. Um, and then I'm going to be heading back home from, from your place down straight down towards Atlanta, Georgia, and then back, um, towards Louisiana. And so, you know, you can email me at nick at homegrownliberty.com with okay. consulting in the subject line to, to get uh, put on that, that waiting list. Okay. And uh, yeah, those are the, the best ways to contact me. All right, cool. <clears throat> are you have any trees that you're bringing with you up, up to our place? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring a handful of, uh, of fodder trees to, to get y'all some, some of those hybrid willow and hybrid poplar oh, yeah. and, That'd and be neat. mulberry trees. Yeah. That'd be really cool. Yeah. We'll hook you up if you do that. Let us know. I mean, if you're going to bring like a pickup load full, full of them, we can put the word out and, uh, you know, people will come prepared to take those off your hands. That, sure. Yeah. Really well, neat. Um, we'll be right in the middle of, of propagation season then, um, in July and they, it, it's not really good to dig them, um, okay. or transport them in, in the, the middle of summer. They just, they can't handle that, that stress very well. Okay. Um, but, but I'll, I'll definitely bring, bring some, 
to get planted on your property. Okay, great. Yeah. You know anything about honey locust? Oh, it's, it's, yes, I do. Um, that's another one of those things that, that have gotten honey locust and black locust have gotten wildly popular in the permaculture movement. Uh, yeah. so I'll, I'll bring a branch and, and some thorns with me. Um, cause, cause I'll have clients say, well, what about honey locust? I hear it's really great for cattle. I mean, the pods are, are phenomenal for yeah. cattle. Um, but the pods are the, the thorns are horrible for tractor tires. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I, I liken locust trees to flamethrowers. Oh. Um, they, they can be a very powerful tool, yeah. um, in the right context, but pretty much anyone that ever plays with them gets burned. Yeah. Um, so, so that's why I like to have one of those big, long thorns with thorns on the thorns and thorns coming off of the thorns on the thorns. Yeah. Um, I like to keep one of those in my truck so I can hand it to a client and say, this is why what I haven't want? suggested. Yeah. yeah. This is why I haven't suggested you bring honey locusts on your property. Cause yeah. you don't know what to do with this. Uh, a lady in our, in our group here um, brought up 50 of them. Yep. Not last winter, but the winter before. And she said, here, I sprouted these and I've read about them. And she shared with me all the information that she'd found. Uh, a lot of it was, uh, good information that was brought to light during the Dust Bowl days, and uh, a lot of smart people were working on how to get out of that. But uh, these these trees seem to be a good fix, and then the pods and everything. So I planted them, and now they're up about four feet, and they're thorny. They're really thorny. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. wondering how that's going to work out. Uh, but you never know. Uh, I, I was doing it for the pods mostly. Yep. I planted them right on fence lines and I thought half the pods will drop in with the pigs. The mm -hmm. other half will be on the lawn and we'll get those. Oh, they'll love to eat them. They're very sugary, mm -hmm. tons of carbs in there. Um, yeah. But you will have honey locusts popping up all over the place because those seeds will pass through the GI tract and they'll be deposited right in a little pile of fertility. Yeah. And they'll pop up and... Tractor tires are used to be expensive. Now they're ridiculously expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. All right. I'm going to cut you loose, man. Appreciate you coming. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you. I uh, usually talk to my group here for just a little while and then, um, and then we say good night for the week. So really appreciate it. Look forward to meeting you. Thanks for all the help tonight and all the good stuff. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Au revoir. We'll see you next. Alrighty. See you. Bye bye. Whoa. Whoa. That got me going. Of course, these things always get me going. Last week it was mushrooms and now it's this. But this is it's almost like this resource is here. It's here. And all I have to do is go and harvest it. And I'm, I'm going to be killing two birds with one stone. If I cut all these little popple uh, saplings that come up, and they just come out of the woodwork down on the back part of our property, they encroach in on the hay field is what they do. And we went through one year, and we pulled them out. And some of them were this big, and we just pulled them out. You know, and you couldn't pull them out. You had to dig them and uh, cut them and, and then plowed over it and planted it and uh, kind of took back that hay field that hadn't been planted in 20 years. And there was bulrushes and popples. It was full of it. And it was a lot of work to get all of that out. I mean, a lot of work, weeks, weeks, hard work. And now uh, when I'm cutting hay back there, there'll be, here's a sapling that's four feet tall and it winds up in the hay bale. You know, because I don't stop and do anything. I just cut it off. But they come back every year. So I never really thought about that. I, you know, I'm feeding hay every three days. And I never really think, gee, I wonder if that uh, popple sapling is in here. Huh. But now what I could do 
Um, the tractor that I have is 50 horsepower, 55, I guess. And it has a PTO, power takeoff. So it has a little gear sticking out or a little um, spline shaft sticking out of the back of the tractor. And it's got a three-point hitch, which means I can put an implement on there and I can lift it up and down. And uh, a three-point mulcher or chipper, shredder, uh, would be sort of like what you'd see those things that they they throw the uh, the tops when they cut trees down or when they trim the power lines. <clears throat> Um, it would be like that, only it's a little smaller. And I'm not really interested in in chipping anything that's any bigger than about that, any bigger than two inches. I wouldn't be interested in. Although, like he said, he, if they're not interested in eating it, they just won't. Um, but another thing that Craig told us about was the growth hormones are in the the tips of the deciduous trees in the last, you know, from an inch on down to nothing. That's where the growth hormones are. So if you are cutting those and shredding them and that's food for your animals, they're getting that. Now, whether they're able to utilize it or it just passes through them, I really don't know. But I would reckon that it passes just, just because I know how this creation was kind of made to work, you know, and get better all the time. I would reckon that after the animals eat it, it goes through them. It, it's inoculated uh, in their butt gut, their gut biome, and then deposited in the soil, and the soil gets better. Um, I would reckon that um, they could e either utilize that or it would pass through them. And the soil could utilize it. Either way, if they're creating flesh off of it or milk, or you know, they're able to create more, more pigs or more calves or more bunnies, it's just a win-win. Um, the further we go into this, the more that I see that there's just a lot of information that has been sequestered you know there's no reason why we're just finding this out now there's no reason for that other than we think well we've been so separated from our food and from the production of our food it's just like those guys do it i don't know how they do it but they do it and uh then they got kind of duped into chemical fertilizers and growing certain types of of crops because there's certain type of equipment that harvest those that certain type of crop but you know like we, you would think that cows can only eat silage corn silage and haylage you'd think well they can't eat anything else you're telling me that you can grind up a bunch of sticks and they'll eat it and make milk off of it? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. We'll see about that. Well, we will see about that because <clears throat> I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to bump this to the top of the list. Although my mushroom production is not uh, forgotten about because that was quite the presentation last week and I really got psyched. I have so much to do. Um, as you know, we... Uh, closed down our old butcher shop, the little one, <clears throat> and then we moved across the road, not really across the road, but just across the driveway to our maintenance shop. And we repurposed that as a butcher shop. So we had to put windows in it and we had to finish off the walls and we had to insulate it. And we had to drop more lights and more uh, electrical outlets and things like that. Had to repour the floor, had to make it kind of nice and far more sanitary than it would need to be for a maintenance shop. And um, moving the chicken processing line over there took a little doing. And we started setting it up Monday. And we just got it completed enough. And it's completed enough today to operate tomorrow morning. So <clears throat> there was a lot that went into it. And we had a few 
bumps in the road. Um, one of the water lines that goes under the concrete that we just poured <clears throat> a valve in a little port about this big split during the winter. And I can't even get my hands down in there to, to change the valve. So we can't use that water. And that means we have to break the floor up a little bit just in that area. And I couldn't do it today. So uh, we, we had to make do with uh, running a temporary line in so we could get some water to the the plucker and the scalder and uh, also to the evisceration table and uh yeah i think we're good to go kind of looking forward to starting the season off tomorrow not a big load of chickens by any means i think we have like maybe 50 total um one of our customers that was bringing 100 to us that we actually opened this day up for her she hit a deer with her truck and she has no vehicle to bring her chickens to us. So we almost had to cancel today, but we had taken in a few other people. And we actually have uh, like 15 roosters from the chickens that we, the chicks that we uh, incubated last spring. So they're a year old. Um, they're like, I don't know, barred rocks and... Uh, Jersey Giants, <clears throat> but they got to go. There's like 15 of them, and the poor hens are getting hammered. So today was their last day. They're picked up now, ready to go in the morning. So, um, okay, let me read some of these comments uh, real quick. White Dog, you know how many times a year I see people out brush hogging their fields? Yeah. Yeah, just think if you could clip that off and you were harvesting it and ran it through a chipper shredder and blew it into a wagon or blew it into <clears throat> Yeah. Tony's saying my dad had a small tractor with iron wheels. He used in areas with locust trees. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't be introducing them to my farm. I didn't think of that. All right. Dave and Sonia's with us. Blistic Mystic's with us. Harvest and grind the honey locust. Maybe. Maybe that's what I should do. Rewilder Life. Eye-opening stuff. White Dog is with us. Emily Rose is with us. I also had a weeping willow that was a favorite with the livestock, and I had to cut it and offer it to them so they wouldn't stay out of my driveway. Someone told me that willow will propagate from chips. Well, you need to try it and let us know. I started some mulberry cuttings recently, and they are taking off big time. I used to let goats graze mulberry trees. I guess I'm going to plant way more than I anticipate considering all of this. Yeah, wouldn't it be something... See, I'm, I'm rethinking uh, the whole idea of honey locust down the middle of the hayfield because of those thorns. Huh. But mulberry trees, what about that? You plant them right down the middle of a hayfield. And in the first year, put some irrigation lines out and keep them watered. And um, hmm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really look at that close. Of course, I have a lot of things to do. White dog saying, how long does it have to ferment? I don't know. I think fermentation in this case is a preservation method. And it and it increases palatability to the animal. Um, Penny Lund saying, so existing saplings, is that the same? How about the end three inches or so of his existing branches from larger trees? You know, uh, I think that what he said at the end there really uh, sows it for me. If you were to, you know, chip these and let's say that you blew them into a bag, you know, let's say you blew them into a, a big trash bag and then you clamped it off, let's say, um, and then they ferment in there. Uh, if 
that during that fermentation process, a lot of the wood is going to get broken down. So if you're chipping something that's three inches and it's not palatable, they'll just leave it. No big deal. Then it becomes food for the microorganisms in your field. It's not going to go to waste. So I don't think you can go wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, uh, you know, the guys that are chipping the, uh, the power lines, they're going through and selectively cutting and they're trimming basically. And all those tops, they run them through a chipper, they blow it into a truck and they were working around here a few years ago. And I said, Hey, you guys, you want to dump here? And they're like, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, and they don't care, you know? They could drive into Cadillac and dump it at the power plant. They don't care. They're getting paid while they're driving. If they drive to some nice little farm here, they don't care. They just want to dump the chips, you know. And if they have to write on their sheet that they drove, you know, 15 minutes to dump chips, so be it. They're still getting paid. So the guys, the individual guys don't care. It's usually the foreman that doesn't want his guys driving up through town, you know, to the other side of the ski hill, down past the beach. He doesn't want them doing that. He wants efficiency. So if you're closer than the dump site, that is maybe a power plant or something like that, they'll dump on you. And we, uh, I had, I had asked them to dump and the guy said, how much do you want? I said, Oh, you can you got plenty of room. You can just keep going. And within about a week, I was like, ooh, that's a lot of chips. So I started pushing it into a pile. And it was getting higher and higher and higher and bigger and bigger. The whole farm had that smell about it, just that that nice freshly cut, you know, and they're cutting everything, every kind of tree that's touching or close to the power line. So was, there was a lot of pine in there, a lot of white pine and stuff. So it smelled really good. What I did with it is I just take it by the, the bucket load and I dump it in with the pigs and they'd go through it. You know, they were real happy to go through it and they ate a lot of it too. And when I first started doing it, I thought, I wonder if there's a problem with this. You know, I really didn't know. And I really didn't know anybody that I could ask. And usually in my experience, uh, if you feed something to the pigs that it's going to kill them, they will not eat it. Now goats are not the same. Goats will eat themselves into extinction if we'd let them. That's why I don't think they belong in the planet because they should have extincted themselves by now. <clears throat> but uh, pigs will not, and I don't think cows will either. I've heard stories of cows, oh, they'll eat bracken ferns and die. They won't eat bracken ferns. Nobody wants to eat bracken ferns. I've heard that, but I've not seen it. And I haven't seen everything, but I've seen enough. Um. There was a time, this is story time, when I first moved here, I was pretty good friends with Jill's grandfather. And he was probably about, he's probably about 89 years old when we moved here. So he was, he was an old timer, but he was still going. Get up, put his dickies on every day, got to get to work, he'd say. And his, you know, he did stuff. He was always like improving his property or mowing the lawn, things like that. Well, he fertilized the trees in the front of his property. Uh, he was a he was a big, he'd go and he'd buy fertilizer. He's like, this is God's gift to man, you know. He's an old farmer too. And uh, so he's fertilizing his, his lawn for the longest time and he had some big oak trees out there. And those oak trees were love, loving that, uh, fertilizer and he would get acorns dropping off those oak trees and I mean these things were big they were five feet across at the base they're gone now the new owners cut them down because they dropped so many acorns and they weren't just your regular acorns these things were like chestnuts and they would drop they would dent his car <laughs> and all night long they'd be hitting the roof. And I think that him and grandma moved into the basement 
in the sum in the fall time because the acorns he called them acorns would be hitting the house and it drove him crazy you know because occasionally one would hit like the um the gutter you know where you know what i mean by the gutter and the gutters like sheet aluminum or sheet sheet steel or whatever um sheet metal and it would hit that and bang you know or something so he said to me one time you know it's just too bad you can't do something with these things because they'd be smashed all over his driveway and i said yeah i don't think you could feed them to pigs because it would probably make the meat it'd probably make the pig meat bitter yeah they'd never eat them and we both agreed on it right there there's an 89 year old guy and me i was like just coming out of the service so i was like 40. And we both agreed that pigs would never eat them. And then it was probably mm, four years later or five maybe that I started raising Mangalitsa. And we were told by the people that that brought the pigs over to the United States, the, the Wiesners, they were from uh, Austria. And they said, oh, no, you want to feed acorns to the Mangalitsa because it has tannins in it. And you heard Nick say uh, that, well, some of these they won't like because there's too much tannins, too many tannins in it. Tannins are tannic acid, right? And tannic acid, if you taste it, break it, if you want to see what that tastes like, just get an acorn, a fresh one, and bite it. And then bite into that meat that's in there and you'll find out what tannins taste like not too good i mean you can eat them if you you could eat an acorn if you had to um but uh pigs love them they absolutely love them right so and those tannins wind up in their fat and notice the word tannin or tannic acid and what do you do when you want to preserve a hide? You tan it, right? So what do you tan it with? Oh, you take acorns, you soak them in water, you get rid of those nasty acorns, and you use this water to put your buck skins in, your deer hides, after you've, you know, you've flushed them and you've scraped all the hair off of them, you put it in the tannic acid or the tannins, that is in that water that you've leached out of your acorns and then your hides are tanned and then you can soften them and they will they will what what a tanned hide as opposed to a non-tanned hide a non-tanned hide will just disintegrate right it's just going to rot and become nothing and it's designed to do that right all of these things around us the us, the animals, the flora, you know, it's all designed to go back to the earth, dust to dust, you know, ashes to ashes type stuff. And it will all go back to the earth. You leave a dead cat in the driveway and after a little while, it's not even there anymore. Who knows where to go? I don't know, but it's gone. Oh, there's some of the hairs here. That'll be gone in the spring too. You know, same thing. But when you, when you tan the hide, you're resisting rancidity. You're stopping that microbiological action that will take it back to the earth. Same thing when we feed it to pigs, it's in their fat. And then we take that back leg off of a pig and we want to save it until next summer. How do we do that? Well, it's got a lot of tannins in the fat. Chances are it'll just cure on its own. Let's put a little salt on here just to make sure. So we put a little salt on it, maybe hang it in a smoker, get some of that good smoke on there. And that thing is preserved forever. You know, the shelf life on it is, is amazing, actually amazing. There's a story in uh, Back to Basics, uh, Reader's Digest, Back to Basics book, a very good book, highly recommend it. But there's a story in there about preservation of meat and the story goes like this uh, a farmer finds out that his wife is going to have a baby girl or no finds well back in, back in those days you know 
uh, there wasn't ultrasounds and stuff. So she has a baby, and the farmer finds out it's a girl. He slaughters a pig, and he hangs the hams, hangs them. That means he takes them off. He puts a little salt on the bone, and and he hangs them. He hangs them in a place where it's going to be plus or minus 60 degrees, you know, plus or minus 20. Uh, he does this in the fall. It's the same time we do it because you can't have any, you know, maggots. You can't have any flies interrupting your your ham making. So you do it in the fall when the flies are gone. And then it cures by just hanging in a 60-degree environment, about 60% humidity. And, uh, you know, back in those days, I don't know how they measured the humidity, but they had things called spring houses that we, uh, we've forgotten what those are, but they're really good technology. But anyway, and then he would serve those hams at her wedding. Yeah. So they did marry him off young back then. So she would have had to been at least 14 years old, but I, I would reckon she was more like 18 or 19. You know, even even back then, way back then. All right. So tannins are a good thing. I'm going to give this a try. Uh, and when I do this, I'm going to document it as well. I'm going to and put it on the tribe. This is breaking breakthrough technology. Notice what he said. He was he was looking at uh, permaculture. This permaculture's got some good stuff, but he's right. The the, uh, the philosophy. I found it to be a little bit not useful. You know, it's, it's, that's, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to do something completely different. So some of the things that they, that they preach are pretty good, but then uh, they become sort of like axioms. Like I had the people that were kind of coming here and using our facility to teach their permaculture I would say, yeah, well, if you guys want to do some permaculture project, by all means. And they said, oh, well, we have to build swales. Swales. Yes, swales. And it was like, well, uh, where do you want to build these swales? And, well, probably right across your hay field. Because that way, the water that would flow down will, will get somehow retained in this swale, and you'll have a lot more water. And he said, you know, it rains hard here, but I've never seen it rolling down the hill. Uh, so, no, you're not going to put one in my in my hay field. Because how am I going to run my hay equipment through there? You know, it just didn't make sense. And they were more like, well, the swale and the permaculture itself is far more important than your farm profiting and you staying on this farm. And I would say, no, uh, I have to profit and I have to be able to make ends meet here or else in uh, industrial agriculture is going to take it over and they'll strip everything off of it and they'll plant it all in corn and uh, soybeans. And none of this stuff will be here. No trees, no nothing. We'll, it'll all be gone. So we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things as well. But um, some of the some of the things were good, um, but I, I I don't I don't claim permaculture either myself. Um, I do believe that your processes that you do on your homestead, uh, you know, we we have like a column uh, assets and liabilities. If you have something that's in the liability column, just wait. Just wait. Um, you look at it and you say, well, that, you know, there's got to be some way that that's actually a, becomes a, an asset to me. And did I say that right? You have something that's in your liability column and you don't know how you're going to move it over to the asset column. But just give it some time and give it some thought and ask yourself the question before you drift off to sleep at night. How am I going to move that? over into the, you know, the, the uh, asset column. I, uh, you know, we have the chicken butchering business. I tell you guys this all the time. And we first started up, 
we were burying the guts. So I had a hole that I dug and then we would go over there and kind of dump in it. And then it would get covered with flies and it would stink. And I would try to throw a little bit of dirt over it, but it didn't matter. They'd get through it, you know, and then occasionally a dog would get to it and that dog would want to come right over and lick you on the face. And it's like, oh, this is not going to work. It would draw all kinds of vermin, skunks. Um, it was it was just really bad. And then we started raising mangalitsa pigs, and there was a guy here, and he said, "Oh, you need to feed those guts to the pigs." I said, "Really? You know isn't that that's kind of gross, don't you think?" And he says, "Chicken's chicken. You know, protein's protein. Don't worry about it. Do it." I said, well, I don't want my customers to see that. And he says, you need a grinder. So he was thinking I was going to grind all these chicken guts, the heads and feet and all that stuff, and then feed it to the pigs. I wasn't going to do that. So I did it. And the first time I did it, I didn't even tell anybody I did it. Did not even tell my wife that I'd done it. Because I thought that she would say, oh, that's way too gross. Don't do that. But then after a while of doing it, I realized, you know, if I've got 30 pigs in a field, and I bring over a, a tractor bucket full that's a third of a yard, and I dump that, heads, feet, guts, um, no feathers. Um, I dump that. By the time I get back to get another load and come back with it, it's gone. I mean, there's nothing left. There is not a foot. There's nothing left. It's gone. So they convert it to pig meat and poop it out on the field as manure. Um, you can still go out there to that field. And even though there's 30 pigs on that field, you will not smell pig. Right. But if I was trying to compost it, Oh, you would smell chicken guts. You would smell it. And then you would smell skunk on your dogs too, because the skunks come to the compost pile and you know, so uh, feathers, I do not give those to the pigs because they don't eat them. They just sniff them, push them around a little bit, and then leave them. They don't eat. And now the older pigs, if I were to do it, they'd be like, ah, we know that trick. We're not even going to sniff it. Um, and then they, the, the feathers dry and they blow all over the place. And it makes, uh, you know, a temporary mess. It does... Uh, straighten itself out because they all go back to the earth. So now what we do is we keep a good hot compost pile going in the, uh, I'll be starting a new one here soon. And, uh, um, we put the feathers in there, uh, along those lines, uh, the new chicken house that we built, I intentionally built it on a concrete slab because I wanted the second harvest, right? The first harvest, I suppose, is the eggs. The second harvest is the manure, right? So, you know, they're in their little house and they're on the perches from the time it gets dark until the time the sun comes up and they manure all night long. And so all of that is falling. And I, I want that because this compost pile that I'm about to begin so I'll be cleaning out the loafing area for the, the cows and there's quite a bit of manure and I'll pile it and uh, it takes a while for it to get going. But if I open it up, uh, like let's say I've got a pile of manure and I break the top of it open. So I put the bucket of the loader in it and I pull it towards me and then I dump in a bucket of chicken manure and it and then close it back up. It's sitting on the top. It's getting some warmth from the sun. The bacteria in there will just explode, and then it will activate that entire pile. And before you know it, that pile is hot. I mean hot. You can break it open in the morning, and steam will just billow out of it. And it's, the, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, we do that, and that is what I call the second harvest because – that goes to the, the fields. The fields take advantage of the nutrient that's in it, and we grow more hay. 
Then we cut the hay, we store it in the barn, we feed it to the cows, they make more manure. So in theory, things get better, 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 because there's inputs coming in from off the farm as well. And they're not the ones you might be thinking of. They're the, the sunlight. I get that sunlight. I got a lot of it today. I mean, and it was free. I'm not even going to get a bill on that, right? Of course, they're trying to block that out. I don't know if you've noticed that. They're spraying the things in the sky to block that out. Not every day. They didn't do it today. <clears throat> um, I get rain, and I do not get a bill from that. You'd think the U.S. government would figure out a way to bill us on that. I'm sure they listen to my stream and they'll say, hey, that's a good idea. We didn't think of that. Now we'll send him a bill. Um, so there you go. Um, but I'm, I'm real excited about this. I'm going to try it and I'll get back to you. Okay, that's it for the week. Um, we appreciate all of you coming by. Um, want to remind you again that this was sponsored by Tribe Plus. So if you would like to join up with Tribe Plus, uh, there's lots of information there uh, that Joe puts together, video courses, uh, fence building, chicken processing, pig processing. Um, the list goes on. Hay making. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, all kinds of processing. Um, there's manufacturer's discounts. LEM. LEM makes uh, processing equipment like grinders and saws and things like that. Uh, field and forest. Uh, mushrooms. Um Isaiah boots, boots that I wear, I really have taken a liking to them. And then you get consulting with me. Uh, I don't like to leave the farm to go and do consulting, so we do it online via Zoom call, which is very effective, especially when you're in with a, a smaller, smallish group, four or five people. It's pretty effective because you get to hear the questions that they ask. And um, I think that it's almost more effective than a one-on-one -on -one because in the one-on-one, -on -one, you formulate the questions that that are pertinent to you. Uh, and I'm not there to answer questions. I'm not there to ask you questions. I'm, I mean, I am there to answer your questions, but I'm not there to ask you questions about your farm operations. So uh, other people might be a little further along in their journey and you might pick up stuff from them that you wouldn't otherwise. So I think in just the consulting, you will pay for the service right away because I do not come cheap. If I come to your farm, it's 200 bucks an hour. And uh, most of the time I won't, I won't do it for under uh, four hours. I just won't do it because to travel and then come back, I lose a day of my time. I mean, I will do it, but it does cost. And that's, you know, if I did it for free, I would never be able to be home, you know, so I have to compensate my time for when I leave. It's the same thing with Tribe Plus. If you take advantage of the information that's there, somebody had to put that information there. And that was my son, Joe. He takes care of all this stuff. He's doing a really good job too. Okay. So if you get in now to Tribe Plus, you can get in at the uh, introductory rate, but uh, it may go up. It may go up. It probably will. Okay. Okay, good. Consco, Mark, what do you feed your mangas? Being new to it, want to be sure we are doing it right. That is a consulting call right there. That's not the point of this tonight, you know, just to answer random questions. Uh, or you can come to the, that that was a tribe plus right there. That's a tribe plus. If you want to know everything there is to know about raising mangalitsa pigs, talk to the expert. I've been doing it longer in the United States than anybody anybody. I'm one of the original guys that got in. Everybody else has gone by the wayside. And all the new people that are in, they're doing the same thing that Nick and I were talking about. They're playing middleman. They're saying, well, yeah, you got the pig, 
and you're going to feed the pig, but we are the ones that certify the pig as being a real pig. It's sort of like the whole Catholic thing, you know, to say you're sorry for your sins, you got to go through a priest. I never did buy into that very well. Okay, um, other thing I had to brief you, not this coming weekend, but next weekend, which will be, let's see, let's get this straight. I, especially with Blistic on here. I don't want him showing up here like two weeks ahead of time, like last time. Let me look at my uh, my calendar. Okay, today, this weekend is going to be the 15th and 16th. Next weekend, the 22nd, is Seed Swap Day or Seed Savers Day or whatever. Um, and for more information about that, as far as times and directions to the farm, you can check our website. It's the bakersgreenacres.com, and that information will be on there. Um, but basically, we open the farm up that day. We ask people, hey, bring a picnic lunch or bring a dish to pass, and we'll hang out for the day and swap stuff. So if you have any seed that you want to swap, you know, break it down into small um, quantities, you know, baggies or whatever, and uh, we can swap those. Um, and then we have lunch and just hang out, just talk, walk around the farm, show you what's going on. Hopefully we get a nice day. Uh, last year we all wound up in the house. It wound up snowing that day. But uh, it's supposed to be a good weekend next weekend, isn't it? Let's see. Oh, come on now. Okay, Saturday, Sunday this week. It's going to be good. Ooh, Saturday is going to be beautiful this coming week. Next week, it's going to be bright, sunny. Of course, it's a little ways out. And the high of 47. So not bad. Not bad. You probably, if that's what's going to happen, you probably want to bring a jacket or something. But, um, yep, I don't want to tell you. We'll have a campfire going and all that good stuff. And now we've got much more area that people can get in, you know, than we did last year. All right. Good. Appreciate everybody coming by. Um, like, share, and subscribe and all that stuff. And get out there and get your farming going. Now is the time. Have a sense of urgency. Get her on. Get get it going. All right. We'll see.